very soon we are going to take our first steps into Wrath of the Lich King Classic and rediscover the continent of Northrend once again. Across the various zones of this expansion, there are fascinating landmarks, interesting characters, dangerous enemies, and poop quests. Good lord, why are there so many poop quests? So let's begin our safari and learn about all these little details you never knew existed. For many players, their first steps in Northrend will begin in the Howling Fjord. The main enemy players will be facing are the gargantuan Vrykul. Your blood will be my warpaint. These Vikings have existed ever since the very foundation of Azeroth as Iron Creations, but after the Curse of Flesh, they attempted to stave off this curse by going into stasis for tens of thousands of years. It, it didn't work. But the Vrykul were pulled out of stasis by the Scourge at the beginning of the expansion. Within the fortress called the Shellerbjorn, we can discover the Vrykul being pulled out of their long slumber, including their king named Yimron, who is being awoken by his wife named Queen Angerboda. And we kill her, but before we can kill the king in his stasis, the Lich King shows up and goes, Not yet, Yimron. I have other plans for you. You will serve me better within Utgard Pinnacle. And if these insects survive to find you again, you will get the chance to avenge your wife. You'll come to discover the Lich King showing up and shaking his fist angrily at you happens like a dozen times on your journey to level 80. For Lions players, they'll make their first landing in the town called Valgard, which is constantly being assaulted by the recently awoken Vikings. Now the town of Valgard has an interesting past because it was originally planned to be a large port town during the development of classic World of Warcraft, which is revealed in the Classic WoW Collector's Edition DVD, but of course, that never came to fruition. For Horde players, they'll fly into the fortress called Vengeance Landing, where the Forsaken are wiping out shipwrecked Alliance sailors. And really, there's nothing uh, remarkable about this place. But do you know what is remarkable? This elevator. Howling Fjord is an amazing zone because it is the zone with the most public transportation in all of Azeroth. We got five different giant elevators, a boat, two zeppelins, these things, and a giant rideable turtle. More on that later. And there's just something about public transportation and MMOs that just makes the game so cozy to me. And I really think we need to add more of it. I'm talking commuter buses in Orgrimmar, cable cars in Stormwind, gondolas in Zuldazar, and... Oh. I got so carried away, I almost forgot about these two other elevators in Balgoon's dig site. This location is interesting because this giant titan statue was changed after the beta for Wrath of the Lich King. Originally, this titan forged giant was doing the devil horns with his fingers, but after the official live release of the game, it was changed to a shaka bra sign for unknown reasons. So when I call out shaka bra, look up and give the camera a nice shaka bra. All right, you ready? Yeah. Ready to do some zipping? Yeah. All right, let's hear you say zipline! Zipline! Shaka bra! Woohoo! All right, nice zip! Well, how was it, Cartman? Totally fucking stupid, dude! On the shores of the fjord, we can find a special ship called the Sister Mercy. Aboard the boat is a skeleton crew of pirates who were cursed after they attempted to steal a shield from Fenger the Disgraced at the Vrykul dig site called Shield Hill. What's special about this ship is it's a unique model that is never used anywhere else in game. And you can also board the ship when it pulls up to this small little island. And the staircase kind of just, uh, phases into existence. 
So technically, I guess we can add this ship to our list of public transportation. You also help the pirates in a quest called Sorloff's Booty, where you have to kill this giant elemental. Now, are they talking about the elemental's booty or pirate booty that he has? You can decide that for yourself. And speaking of pirates, on the nearby island called Scalawag Point, we can find my new favorite pirate that represents half of the Horde player base. It's Silver Moon Harry. Now you see, Silver Moon Harry is a human who is obsessed with blood elves, and we can see this with his lovely dress and his tent decorations. Harry even has a girlfriend named Alanya, who he will only talk to if she wears a blood elf mask. Silver Moon Harry would later return in the Battle for Azeroth expansion and help in establishing Fort Victory for the Alliance, with the assumption that he would be working with blood elves. Instead, it was blood trolls. <laughs> Over here at Westgard Keep, we have a rare case of the Alliance being the bad guys. This is one of the only locations where we have an Alliance-controlled Zeppelin that was stolen from a goblin named Harrowmeiser. Now locked in chains, the goblin is forced to yell out the schedule for the ship called the Lady Lug. Where does it travel to? Nowhere. Literally nowhere. It just goes in a giant circle over this glacier. Does anyone want to tell the Alliance that we are in a life or death war with the Lich King and maybe going on cute little sightseeing trips is not the best idea right now? Well, thankfully in the War Crimes book, Harrowmiser is broken out of his imprisonment and uses his Zeppelin to help in the process of breaking out Garrosh Hellscream from his trial. <laughs> Down below the crust of the earth, we can find one of the dark secrets of the Howling Fjord. The Whisper Gulch is a haunted excavation site that has driven the Dwarven miners insane. Within the Gulch, you can hear such whispers as, We are coming for you. You are a pawn in forces unseen. There is no escape. Not in this life, not in the next. One would assume that these are whispers from the old gods, specifically yogg saron but these whispers could also allude to the evil mastermind called the Jailer in the Shadowlands expansion, who has meticulously planned many events in the Warcraft universe, and perhaps this was all planned from the... Nah, these whispers are incredibly vague, and you could say they came from anyone. Okay, let's just uh, talk about the Tuskar. Tuskar are one of the more peaceful races you'll find in Northrend. They typically section themselves off into tribes containing multiple families and spend most of their time fishing from the sea and surviving in this hostile cold climate. They engrave intricate carvings on their tusks to display the family they came from or the great deeds they have accomplished. Also, all Tuskar have mustaches. Yes, even the females. But there are no female models in game. So, we found out about the mustachioed female Tuskar in the Folks and Fairy Tales of Azeroth book. But here's the deal. There are female Tuskar voice lines in the game, right now. But they're never actually used in the game. Which is a shame because this voice actress, she is giving it her all. <laughs> Let us trade for our prosperity. I have much to offer. <laughs> oh, your coin is valuable even out here. The gods we know the Tuskar worship are called Teyutka, who's a female spirit and is the goddess of shelter, Islaruk, who is the god of war, that's an eagle, and Oechinoa, who is the goddess of wisdom. Now, Oichinoa is a giant sea monster players can summon in the quest Conversing with the Depths, who is assumed to be a wild god, and really the only Tuskar god we see in-game. But the final god I want to talk about is named Karkut, who is the god of death. Now, in the next expansion, we know the Tuskar are returning in the Dragon Isles, and this god of death would be a perfect way to naturally slide in Shadowlands lore into the greater universe of Warcraft. Will this actually happen, or will Blizzard just flat out ignore all of the lore that they have built up in Shadowlands and pretend like it doesn't exist? Uh, time will tell. Other than that, there isn't that much depth to the Tuskar that is interesting. But like I said, in the next expansion Dragonflight, the Tuskar will return with female Tuskar. And hopefully we get some more interesting lore about them. But that's for another time. 
So let's take this giant turtle over to our next zone called Dragon Blight. Dragon Blight is one of the zones within Northrend with an extensive history, and probably one of the more significant and haunting locations is the Forgotten Shore. Quick little backstory here. After the zombies infected Stratholme, Arthas killed all of them, and then Malgana shows up and says, hee hee, uh, follow me to Northrend. Arthas responded by saying, I'll hunt you to the ends of the earth if I have to. Do you hear me? To the ends of the earth! And he meant it. He traveled to Northrend with a small army of soldiers, now, originally in Warcraft 3, Arthas landed in Howling Fjord, but during Wrath of the Lich King, it was changed to Dragonblight instead. He spent some time killing Scourge in Northrend looking for Mal'Ganis, but an emissary from Lordaeron showed up, telling Arthas that his mentor Uther and his father, King Terranus Menethil, are ordering him and his men to return home. No one orders me around. I will be twice the king my father was, and three times the dancer. I take my leave of you. Goodbye. Arthas' soldiers wanted to go home because they felt like they were kind of just wasting their time in this frigid hellscape, but Arthas was so obsessed with stopping Malganus that he hired mercenaries to destroy the ships they arrived in, leaving them stranded in Northrend. Then Arthas and his men showed up, accused the mercenaries of doing this by their own free will, and killed them all. This is just one of the many dubious acts Arthas committed in his downward spiral to becoming the Lich King. Arthas would later abandon his men in Northrend, leaving them to suffer a slow, agonizing demise. When we return to the Forgotten Shore, we can now see that it's populated by the haunted ghosts of Arthas's army, who even in undeath, are trying to desperately return home. Why doesn't anyone want to ride on the same boat with me? It's not like I plan on burning the boat or anything. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll burn the boat. And as most of you know, Dragonblight is the focal point for dragons. This sacred land is where all dragons travel to instinctively to die, which explains the plethora of bones that surround the zone. Surrounding the Wormrest Temple are five different dragon shrines, representing the five different flights. The Bronze Dragonflight Shrine is a warm oasis that is a preserved pocket of a past time in Northrend's history, when it had a sunny and warm climate. Here we can find the Bronze Dragonflight in an endless fight with the Infinite Dragonflight. At the Green Dragon Shrine, Ysera be sleeping. At the Azure Dragon Shrine, there is a powerful font of arcane power. At the Ruby Dragon Shrine, there is a large crimson oak in the middle that was formed by a single drop of Alexstrasza's blood that melted into the snow. And lastly, we have the Obsidian Dragon Shrine, which is my favorite because, well, have you ever actually been in here before? It, it's crazy. This place is gigantic and pretty much just a bunch of reused assets from Ragefire Chasm, but still, it's an entire sprawling dungeon in the open world that honestly I never knew even existed. There's also these magma pillars, but they, uh, they kind of just look like poop. Here in Winterguard Keep, the Alliance are in the front lines of combat against the Scourge in their Flying Death Fortress called Max Ramus that has barely changed since we saw it in Classic. Leading the charge is High Commander Halfford Wormbane. He is the Seventh Legion High Commander, former Knight of the Silver Hand, and overall badass. While deployed in Winterguard Keep, he soon learned that spies from the Cult of the Dam lived amongst his troops and had them all executed and had their bodies strung up in front of the keep to bait out local ravenous ghouls from hiding. High Commander Hafford leads players on a long quest chain that has them delve into the heart of Scourge operations in the crypts below, and one of the leaders of this operation is Ambo Cash. He has no pants. 
Within these crypts are these funky low polygon gnome models that are just beating the shit out of these forsaken guys. To my knowledge, the only other place we find NPCs that use these ancient models is within Naxxramas itself. The chief you feel is the herald of your doom. But the real reason why we're in this haunted maze is to kill a lich named Thelzan the Duskbringer. This lich was previously named Inigo Montoy, who players gave Kel'Thuzad's phylactery to in Classic. Little did we know that he was an agent of the Scourge and returned the Flactory to Arthas and was turned into a Lich himself. And this is ultimately the reason why we see Naxxramas and Kel'Thuzad return again in Wrath of the Lich King. You, you completely, completely forgot, forgot to look, look for, for my Flactory! <laughs> Fools. Now players have to right their wrongs and fight Thelzan, and when they engage him in combat, he says, my name is Inigo Montoy. You killed my lich. Prepare to die. Okay, so no, he doesn't say that, but it would be funny if he did. Over on the other side of the zone is the horde base called Agmar's Hammer, led by Overlord Agmar himself. Agmar plays a large role in having the Tonka become a part of the horde. To be honest, there really is no lore about the Tonka other than their bison-flavored taran that live in the snow. I mean, they didn't even give female Tonka new models. Anyways, Overlord Agmar would later return in the Isle of Conquest battleground, with High Commander Halfford Wormbane being his counterpart, which is the commander I referenced earlier in this video. But the real reason why I wanted to talk about Agmar's hammer is to talk about what lurks within the spire of the fortress, to show something that represents the true brutality of the Horde. It's an orphanage, but not just any orphanage. It's the shittiest orphanage in all of Azeroth. Here we find seven Tonka babies just left on a wooden floor. Clearly, the Blizzard developer who decorated this place wanted to spend the least amount of effort possible when designing it. Other things located within Dragonblight are the Nerubians, the Scarlet Crusade, and some more dragon stuff which I'm gonna skip over because I've already made videos about all three that went into excruciating detail. Link down below. So, let's travel to our next zone called Boring Tundra. No, oh, no, wait, it's called Borean Tundra. Borean Tundra is a frozen wasteland that is true to its name because, yeah, no, it's actually pretty boring, but that doesn't mean that there isn't some interesting stuff in the zone. Alliance players will land in Valiant's Keep, where they are dealing with an unending Nerubian assault, but the more dangerous foes are hiding within their defenses. Cult of the Dam members lurk behind every corner within their fortress, and not even their leadership is safe. The captain of the Keep is a man named General Arlos, but his advisor, Counselor Talbot, is not who he says he is. In reality, he is Prince Valinar, Overlord of the Scourge in the Borean Tundra, who is pulling the strings behind the scenes. During one of the final quests in the zone for Alliance players, we find out that he has mind-controlled General Arlos and a woman named Larissa, and brings them to the top of his flying death fortress called the Naxanar. My liege, the infiltration and control of the Alliance power structure by our cultists is well underway. The power you've bestowed upon me has granted me great mental influence over human minds. I bear these offerings as proof of my progress. During this cinematic quest, we kill the prince, but death is never the end for a member of the Scourge. During the Ice Crown Citadel raid, Valinar returns in the Blood Prince's fight, where he says, Naxanar was merely a setback. This is an obvious reference to Kael'thas Sunstrider, who has a popular meme phrase in the community where he goes, But Tempest Keep was merely a setback. These two characters have absolutely nothing in common. Blizzard just wanted to make a random reference. Okay, back to Valiant's Keep. Okay, there's just one last thing I have to mention, okay? And it's the Alliance's horrible interior design skills. Okay, look in this inn, we got one picture of canyons, two pictures of canyons, three pictures of canyons, Four, four pictures of canyons. Look, guys, it's okay to take more than three seconds to decorate a place, okay?
over here at Fizz Crank Airstrip, I'm gonna mention something super quick. Okay, so the main narrative of this part of the zone is that there's an evil mechanome named Gear Master Mechazod who is trying to turn all of the gnomes into cyborg robots to return them to their robotic selves before the curse of flesh. But that is literally the exact same concept used in the story for Mechagon and Battle for Azeroth. Like, the exact same. Except these robotic gnomes are different, but are also called mechanomes. They, they just look a lot weirder. But hey, nobody reads quest text, so I guess you can just reuse the same narrative, right? All right, I saved the most memorable faction for last. Within this raised hunter encampment, the members of the nature preservation group called DETA convene. DETA stands for the Druids of Ethical and Humane Treatment of Animals, and they are an aggressive group of druids willing to stop at nothing to deal with the mistreatment of animals within the zone. The quests they give you involve hunting down crazed poachers, but if you kill any animals around the camp, you will be covered in innocent animal blood. And if you dare wander towards the DETA camp, they will attack you on sight. So, one way to cleanse yourself of your animal killing sins is to jump in a body of water and wash off all of that baby animal blood. Now, I saved the best lore for last. Over here at the Winterven village, there is a Detta member in a murloc suit named King Murgle Murgle, who is trying to study the murlocs from afar. But after a Makura named Kalaxmus decimated their murloc home, they made King Murgle Murgle their new ruler. Also, we never find the king out of his suit so I'm pretty sure he is the only canonical furry in the Warcraft universe. We later find King Murgle Murgle in the Cataclysm, helping in Hyjal when doing the Protectors of Hyjal daily quest. Then we find him in Legion, helping another Murloc tribe called the Murkloc tribe. Yeah, creative name there. But, oh, in Battle for Azeroth, we find the king in Nazjatar, where he has an entire restaurant called Murgle's Bar and Gill, and it's filled with Murloc patrons, and oh my, just look at it. Oh my, it's beautiful. Yeah, no, we're ending the video here.